this is a, going to be probably the last lecture on the topic of shape motions. What we will talk is briefly the derived responses. What does it mean? See, so far we talked about the primary shape motions that is heave, roll, pitch, sway, surge, yaw. But normally the practicing engineers want information of ship behavior in terms of other quantities like how badly it slams when it goes like you know hits the bottom, how frequently the water comes on the deck, how much the propeller comes out of water and so performance deteriorates etc etc. These are no called derived responses I will talk in a minute. Before that doing that I just want a general uh, formula uh, to, be, uh, to be told that supposing you take any point here and I want to find out what is my uh, you know like suppose this point is located at the vector r and this is moving at omega what is the you know for any given point motion now that i told beforehand actually the reason i am mentioning is that in derived responses what would happen is that you might be interested to find motion at various other points not at the primary point see this is my center of gravity and how the center of gravity suppose with respect to an coordinate system this is my vector xg how much x t moves up and down with time is what actually we told by say heave roll pitch yaw etc. Sorry the linear motion uh, maybe I should see this is my center of gravity here and uh, this this vector with respect to fixed let us say is called x g. So x g as a function of time if you take how much it is moving vertical direction see if you take x g this is my linear motion surge sway heave and if you take this a rotation vector omega and if you take the angle of that actually the you know the, the angular orientation of that say say big theta then this this omega vector is derivative it is actually the sway surge and roll you know like uh, sorry I'm sorry roll pitch and yaw what I mean is that Basically, you can find out the, the displacement of any point P at any point P in terms of x g plus a vector called your, um, your, your th theta dot uh, uh, cross r, something like that, r cross theta whatever. In other words, this is a very simple thing. Wh what I want to say here is that see, that if you knew the six modes of motion, this and this you can find out at any point what of course r is a known uh, location so you can find out motion at any point it's a very simple thing actually you can work it out i can just tell you that x p the, the x of that becomes actually surge x g 1 plus this becomes theta 2 r 3 minus theta 3 r 2 etc etc i mean it, it is very simple uh, let us not get into that, that. let us say okay let me write the other one say z p z p is this y p here okay since i am writing plus 2 3 3 2 this is 3 1 1 3 2 3 3 1 1 2 it becomes then x g 3 plus theta 1 or 2 minus theta 2 or it may be incorrect but something like that 2 3 1 3 1 2 it is very cyclic you know if you write a program you can never make a mistake you will see there is 3 2 1 uh, uh, like a cycle 1 2 3 if you take 3 2 1 or 2 3 2 3 1 3 1 2 like that it goes okay basically this one for example can be written as this is heave plus theta 1 is actually roll roll into r2 is actually the uh, y coordinate of the point minus theta 2 is pitch into x coordinate of the point like that you see it is a very simple thing all you need not worry about the mathematics I have actually done that at one point of time but it is very simple that if you could find out roll uh, all the six primary motions what you have effectively said is that I can tell where the ship is at any point of time that means I can tell where it is therefore I can tell where which each point is therefore I can tell the look displacement of any point then by derivative I can take its acceleration then I by double derivative I can take its you know velocity acceleration etc. So I know all that thing so these all these are all information about motions at any point of the hull 
can be derived from the six prime running motion. So, you can say that they can be derived from the six motions. So, once you know the six, it is a one line operation. You just line the formula, just plug the numbers, that is it. Okay. But what happens, you may be interested more on that information. For example, you might want to know what is an acceleration at a given point, because you might have put here some kind of instrument, say a gun mount for a naval vessel, that I will act as a force, moment of inertia into, I mean in the inertia force is mass into acceleration. Suppose your housing is here, you would like to know what is the acceleration of that on, the, on that house, because your body is subjected to that, you know, depending on where you are sleeping. This is the reason, one of the reasons why people sleep this way, you know, of course, nowadays they sleep also breath wise, but anyhow. So, this is all kind of derived things. Okay. Now, let us uh, now look at the various kind of derived responses one by one, I just want to say very quickly. One of them you can call bow motion. What is bow motion? It is actually, this is a shape here you take a bow point say fp what is the vertical motion in fp fine that's no problem you can just find out vertical motion by uh, combining heave and pitch you know all you are doing is that you what is the motion what is my z motion at bow means what is my z motion at x equal to say l by 2 or whatever something like that uh, or, or or at x equal to f, fp this is my bow motion. You understand why why people want to know bow motion because you want to know how much bow is going, but that is not the important thing. What people want to know is relative bow motion. Uh, that is if there is a wave here, there is a there is a wave here. Okay. Now, you would know, I would know my bow motion z at bow. This will be given by some formula, say something into cos omega t plus some phase angle, something like that. I will get that by combining. Now, relative bow motion, relative bow motion is going to be z bow minus the wave height at the bow minus say zeta at bow. That I know what is zeta at bow, because what is zeta at bow is nothing but it is zeta a into cos k x minus omega t with taken x as l by 2. So, you see the principle is very simple, principle is very simple, here the ship has moved so much up and there the you know the wave has moved so much up, so you can find out how much the you know the relatively this point a given, actually here you have to take a particular point z bow, instead of z bow you have to take a point here, say I, I take a point p here, then I can find out a point on the, on the four, four peak for example, how, how much it is from with respect to wave, you see something like this, I can tell at any point of time, this point, how far it is from this, because it can be next instance. And you see the phase information becomes very important, because supposing that this diagram is uh, interesting, because supposing I my wave is here, one case, uh, let me use other color. So, I can have a wave going like that, or I can have a wave, here the my, my this thing is very short or I can have the wave actually going like that, then I have got very high. So, you see what this of course, depends on the phase, when the see just think of that, when the wave is rising, ship might be going down, then my, my uh, basically the, what happen is that the relative bow motion will may come down to very small value, may become very large value. So, it will oscillate between small to large value. Okay. Now, what happen is that, here comes the interesting part. Now, I know this, this value say r. Now, I, what I will do, I will find out, you see at any point of time is r is becoming less than the, the free board. See, after all there is a free board here. Okay. If r becomes less than the free board, then I say that if r is less than say free board in some sense, okay, then I say that deck wetness has occurred, is not it? Because what happened that you see that there is so much gap. Now, the wave has gone up, a ship has come down. So, the gap between the, 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 the height of the point with respect to wave height is supposed to be actually some number, but it has become less than some threshold number. We can work the detail out, but the principle is very simple. There is a particular point, it is actually with respect to absolute value so much high. So, with respect to wave, it is so much high, but it must be always above the wave height. So, you can find out 
if it has become 0, if supposing this, this height, if I call this r, if this r has become negative, actually here this is not same as minus 3 volt, that is again using another reference, but just think if this point with respect to the wave, I am, I am, I am fair saying that the distance of this point above the wave height, above the actual water surface is r, that is the relative motion of this point. Okay. In fact, they call the relative motion of the point actually at this location, that is why this free board comes in, but forget it. Just think the, the, the concept, I take a particular point as a representative point, I will say that if that point comes down below water, then it is the deck is getting wet. Let us draw this another picture uh, better way. So, I have a point here, let me see, I, I just draw this way. Yeah. If I take this point actually, now supposing I have this point and this is my wave height and this is my reference, see some reference is like this, this is my reference. Now what happens, see here, uh, you can say free body, yeah, my mean water line, whatever, some this thing, say this one is my bow motion, how much is going and this one is my wave height and this much is my relative motion and you are doing negatively. In this case you see then R which if I take this C, supposing I call this to be bow motion B and if I call this to be zeta, B minus zeta, then this has become negative. You know, in other words zeta has become more than B, so therefore the deck is wet. Okay. So I can find out from the again since I have got now what I will do is that I will take for this R a spectrum because you see this R is nothing but again a sign motion. So I can find out see R if you expand that. R will turn out to be equal to some amplitude into some cos omega t plus beta something like that. So, I can find out basically RAO for uh, you know RAO for relative bow motion and I can draw a spectrum. Then I can from the spectrum find out what is the probability of my R becoming less than 0. You see I will have a spectrum. No, I know the value of uh, S etcetera and I, as I told you that from there you can find out all quantities of this response, whether it is less than so and so, what is the chance it will be more than so and so, what, how many times it will occur uh, uh, once in so many years, all that you can find out. So you see very simple, uh, I mean formulas, I am not going to the formulas, but the principle is important. You can find out very easily just by another one line formula, what is the chance or what is the probability or what percentage of, or percentage of time R becomes negative. So, you can tell suppose it is 25 percent of time in that particular C state R becomes negative. So, you say the deck gets wet 25 percent of time. People actually say in terms of uh, cycles that you know that can be uh, that can be said that how much at every how many seconds R will become negative. So, you say let us say that is 5 seconds. So, you will say that every 5 seconds I have got a deck getting wet, every 5 seconds the deck gets wet. Like that all information that you want statistical you can find out from there for, for this. So, again you see this is a derived response because how did I get R? R is nothing but bow motion minus the wave motion which all are available to me. And again as I mentioned before it is again a sinusoidal motion. Now, exactly same way I can find the probability of slamming. What is slamming? The other way around slamming would be uh, in, in, uh, in, in a case of slamming, it would be, I, I do not say slamming right now, let us say it is uh, uh, the probability of bow, uh, I mean coming out of water. Again you take this point or some point and find out again it is you know relative motion the other way around. If you take this point for example, if this point is above this height then obviously it is the, you know, the deck has come out, uh, the four, four peak has come, you may call four peak emergence, four peak has come out. So, you can find out how much time the four peak comes out. Of course, slamming is a phenomena uh, that is connected to the impact. What happens is that sometime it turns out that, that the ship's four peak comes out like that and it when it comes down, it hits here and if you actually take a point here and make a pressure, you will see the pressure is going like that, like that. Suddenly goes up very high. When it hits here, it becomes very high. This is called a slamming and people, especially the society people wants to know slamming pressure. Now or you want to find out probability of slamming. 
how much uh, you know or, or what kind of time it, it will stand. Now you see the chances that the bow will emerge, I, I, as I said you can find out by again finding out the chances of this point coming out of water, exactly the same way. But for slamming there is a, uh, you know people have given many speculation, slamming occurrence, it turns out you will slay, see every time it hits may not slam, you say normally that the, you see this is coming down with a velocity and this particular uh, water also coming up with a velocity. So the relative velocity of impact, the relative velocity by which it is entering water, say I call it VR, you know, okay of the bow point of this some point, if this is exceeding some, some value, people say that slamming has occurred. So in other words, you actually introduce a criteria that you say that I will tell slam has occurred provided the rate at which it is meeting the surface, the relative velocity of that particular point exceeds some right values, uh, something like say 0.3 g or some, some, some number is there. Okay. Let us just take the principle of it. Essentially, is, it is found out that it is connected to the rate at which, see after all if the ship is coming down very slowly, it see, think, think of this, the ship has come out of the water, fine. So you can tell it has, it's, it has the bow has emerged, but when it is coming down, it is coming down very slowly. As it comes down very slowly, although it, it is coming down, it may not give that pressure. So slamming normally is, you can imagine intuitively is related to how fast it is coming down. You know, if you take a, 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 a stone and throw like that, it gives much more impact. If you just drop it, it will be much smaller. So you know it is connected to velocity. So in here, the criteria that is derived is that what is the, uh, I mean, uh, rather I will say other way down. If this point is the relative velocity of the point with respect to the water surface or you may say the relative velocity of this. Uh, uh, point at which it is entering water exceeds or is more than some number, then you will call that it has got, uh, it has got slamming. Now again that you can find out because you know now velocity, see I know the distance, so I know the, this point's location, so I know the relative uh, distance of R, you know of this point particular P, which will be of course the, uh, the Z of the point P minus Xi at the point P, the wave height C, I can find out the relative displacement of that just like I had done before which is the z value of the point P minus the uh, wave height. Then if I do a dot, I will get the velocity of that, that all. So I know again exactly the same way the velocity uh, uh, distribution of that point. Okay, I will know that by, I can draw the spectrum. Again I can have an area of that velocity. Uh, see these are all responses. Case number one, I did uh, bow, bow motion displacement. Two, I did relative bow motion. Now I am doing, say, relative uh, bottom uh, motion of the bottom point. Now I am doing relative velocity of the bottom point. So I say now, so I know how much the relative velocity, how it occurs. So I know this is my relative velocity, this is S relative velocity spectrum. From there again, I will find out what is the chance that it has exceeded so much. So then I say that it is, so you know, slamming percentage is so much. In fact, again, everything I can find out, I can tell slamming would occur once in so many cycles. See, I can find out what is called, a, you know, average period. Then I find out that it occurs at every, say, 100 seconds. Now, average period 10 seconds. So, I will tell that every 10 cycle, that 10 times it, it, it slams. People like to know that, you know, severity of slam, there is, this is a subjective decision. There is no objective. You are sitting on a ship, you, you find that it is banging, banging. You have to quantify that. There is no hard and fast quantification, so you tell in terms of some kind of statistical term. You say it is bad, it is bad for you but not bad for you. So you say, okay, I will tell that if it is more than this, it is bad. Like that, there are some criteria. So here you will say that if, say, you know, velocity is more than this, it is slamming. Similarly, once you know now, uh, now you define slamming to be so and so, then you can find out the chance of slamming, number of times it slams in one hour. Normally, people like to know this actually, how, what is the number of times it may slam in one hour. See, you can find that out also because if you know it slams once in 100 seconds, then in 3600, 36 times it will slam. So, all this you can find out. This, we are, I am not going through that, the typical way of deriving, but you can find out this. Again, derived response. Same way, I will have to go little quickly, uh, slamming is gone. Then uh, propeller emergence, sometimes you want to do the same thing that propeller is coming out of water. Again you will say that propeller location, the center plane of pro propeller you define and find out relative motion, what is the chance of it is coming out of water. 
see again here you take this particular propeller point this this point as p find out what is the chance that it comes out of water same thing okay there is no no difference okay then some people will like, want to know this is propeller you can relate this propeller emergence with uh, with propulsive performance because you, you can now tell that if it emerges more than this thing my my thrust i get is so much so you can relate you can say that look since my propeller emerges so many times and if every time it emerges my thrust goes down so my there is a reduction of thrust so you can relate that too you can say that i am going to get average sense in a c state 5 i am going to get 20 percent less thrust in a average sense c state 6 i get 40 percent less thrust etc etc okay uh, the, the, the important thing that is actually more important for us is a quantity called added resistance that i i should tell a little bit of this this is another derived response you can say. See, this is actually interesting because it is a part of resistance, but it is actually a skewing phenomena. You know, if you now in, in resistance, uh, sometimes they add this thing as a as some 30 percent factor of safety, all comes within that. You see, if you have a ship here moving in calm water, what happens? It gives a resistance RT. So, RT is calm water. You have done that early part of this course, okay, fine. Now, you take the same speed going at same speed, but now it is going in wave. What happened? It is going to give you R t star in wave, let us say. Now, if you take difference of this minus that, that means R t star in wave minus R t in calm water, this is called R added. In other words, how much more resistance the ship will experience if it is going in a wave compared to if it is going in a calm water. Okay. Now, the question is that why it is a skewing phenomena? You may say, but that is only a simple phenomena of resistance, you know, instead of calm water you have got wave, but no, it is a skewing phenomena, I will explain to you that, but you understand this concept first. You see, everybody understood this, that in rough weather, to sustain the same speed, you have to have more energy because the, th the, the you know, resistance goes up or what you, the people experience is the reverse that in rough weather automatically if the engine RPM is remain constant, the speed falls down. You would have <laughs> experienced that in rough weather speed has come down, you did not do anything, engine is still set at that RPM because the drag has gone up. Okay. Why the drag goes up? is a question that I will just very briefly mention and that is called added resistance that that comes out from C keeping not from resistance calculation. You see what happened? You think of this case when the ship is moving in calm water, what happen it makes waves. Okay. When it makes waves, we say that it has expended energy, it has spent energy and that energy shows up at wave resistance, that is what we say. Now you see already existing wave there. As the ship moves, what it does? It is heaving and pitching, right? Now, you consider a ship heaving and pitching in calm water. You just take a ship, it is heaving and pitching. What will happen? It is going to create another set of uh, another um, waves. So, by the fact that the ship heaves and pitches in calm water, it creates waves which is a loss of energy and that energy shows up at added resistance, you see. Therefore, added resistance is coming out because of the fact that the ship is heaving and pitching. And the ship is heaving and pitching because it is in waves. It is not so much because of, uh, you know, that uh, change of weighted surface because of that and all, because weighted surface change normally gets compensated plus minus k, k because what happened, the net underwater uh, area does not change very much. So, people may think that when it is going in waves, I have a weighted surface different it won't be very much different because the buoyancy which is somewhat connected to weighted surface remains more or less constant. So, you know if there is a some part it goes up, some part comes down. So, if you take a mean surface and an instantaneous surface, there is a difference, but not much. The added resistance is not primarily for that. The you know the why I say is that you may think Are it is going in waves. Therefore, uh, I have got so called weighted surface changing so my skin friction will change. Okay, that is what a first impression of a beginner might be, but normally that is not the main issue. 
main issue is that is not seen is that the ship is going with a up and down motion. As it goes up and down motion, it actually makes waves which shows up as a loss of energy. This is actually damping and therefore, you can express added resistance as a function of motions. There are expressions where you can find out that added resistance expression is function of basically heave and pitch motion, basically heave and pitch motions and damping and all that. You, you can relate that there are formulas available where you can find out that added resistance is something p square and something this thing. And in fact, theoretically it is a complex phenomena because it is known as what is called a non-linear or second order phenomena. I do not want to go into the detail, but this is known as this is a more difficult to estimate. It is called a non-linear second order force. It is equivalent to a drift force. If you if you keep an offshore structure in, in place, if waves keeps coming, this will have a force coming up and down, but in addition there will be a net small force in one direction. People do not see that. If you have a wall here for example, if a waves comes and hits here, there will be, there will be a pressure this way and there is a pressure that way. Okay. So, if you want to draw the force, you may think it is like that. You know, at point force is plus minus, but actually reality it is not. The reality the force is actually like this. It is about a steady part and that part is called a drift force. There is a net force that comes from one side, same as this net force that comes from the shape, which is actually equivalent to this added resistance. It is a all complicated phenomena, I do not, I will not get into the detail, but it is an interesting phenomena that in waves and all, if you keep a body and waves come from one side, then it is not only up and down force, there is still a net force in that direction, small net force comes in that direction, that is not ever seen normally. And you cannot explain that from what is called simple sine wave, uh, simple first order pressure theory. You need little more sophistication for that, but it is a reality. You cannot see as long as it is reality, just because maths is complicated, you cannot say that I am go not going to be bothered. See after all, we have to kind of predict reality. Our aim is to predict reality with as simple maths as possible, but as somebody said, in fact Einstein said everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. You cannot make it simple enough when the phenomena is not there. So, this uh, re resistance, added resistance is a real phenomena. You cannot say I will not be bothered with second order force or whatever, because then you have no added resistance, but then in reality it is there. Anyhow, the, the point of that my, my this uh, part is that it is also a derived response. It is not a part of resistance generally. In to find out added resistance, you have to solve or you have to know the ship motions. So, added resistance arises because of ship motions. Okay. This so obviously this is a derived response, purely a derived response. Okay. Now uh, comes uh, uh, the next uh, thing. This is again, as I say, one of the uh, uh, derived response. Let us say C sickness. This I talked a little bit earlier. Again, this is a see. It is found out again. It's somewhat subjective. You know, we we have all um, sort of found out. It if people find out by taking lot of study of subjects. You know, you take ship uh, hundreds of people on a ship, monitor the response and find out how many people have vomited. Like that, people have done, and it find, found out that this they they call it some. A motion sickness index, some term they have actually used motion sickness index. This turns out to be function of actually acceleration at some point where you are, you know, that the housing is location and frequency. It turns out that a certain combination of frequency and acceleration, you actually have a large motion sickness. I will show you that uh, the diagram. So, in fact, uh, the motion sickness index looks something like that. If you do this, if you say motion sickness index. Uh, incident. It motion sickness in incident means so many, this is 100 here, it looks something like uh, this is all side three dot, dot that is actually acceleration that uh, vertical. So, this may be some value say this may be See, I give, give an example. What it turns out is that there is a, you can actually draw a graph, frequency versus motion signal index for various acceleration. It turns out that 
the graph looks something like that. That means for its lower acceleration, say this may be a, a actually 0.1 g, uh, say 0.1 g, if the frequent, you know, like th this is percentage, maybe this is actually 30 percent. What it says is that naturally, if this acceleration is more than this at this frequency, then so many percentage of people have become sick. If higher frequency or lower frequency, same acceleration, less people get uh, fall sick. So, there is a co combination of that. See, it is depending on a function of you know acceleration, uh, sorry, this acceleration as well as frequency. So, at a if a, for a given frequency, your body, you know, the place where you stay, you exceed certain acceleration, you have certain percentage of people falling sick called by MSI. For example, here it, according to this diagram, this, this thing it turns out to be about 1.10 uh, radian per second. This peak, peak occurs around that. For most people, the, you know, many things it is found out that around that, that means if your this 1.10 means 2 pi by t means about say 6 seconds, around 6 second period, 6 second, you know, you tend to have the largest MSI, you know, statistics shows, you know, people who are on working on ship do not throw up, I am talking of passengers, you know, this crew comfort, passenger comfort. And if it of course exceeds about say, uh, say 0.5 g, at that thing it turns out almost, you know, the uh, uh, theory shows almost 100 percent people fall sick or 90 percent or so. This is how you study. Again, why I am saying that? Because if you look at that, the motion signal index to study, again it is a part of a derived response. Why? Because there is an acceleration there at a given location, you get that from the point, you find that displacement at the point and acceleration and of course omega e. So, obviously, if a small vessel for which you have got lower omega e normally in a given C state and it is accelerating further, you are tend to fall more sick normally. Obviously, you know like if you take a small boat, it will have a lower natural period and lower natural period also gives you larger acceleration because it is omega e square times. So, you have a larger chance of falling sick in a, uh, if you are traveling in a barge in ocean, then if you are traveling in a large tanker in the ocean. I mean, this is a normal phenomena. I think you know much more than I would. I am only theory, theory I am telling. But this is what it is. But what my point of here saying is that even this can be found out by C keeping calculation motion. All this happens to be basically a derivation of ship motion or result of ship motion. Fact that the ship is moving, not a steady, uh, you know, like the platform all this uh, arises. In fact, nowadays there is a large number of study that goes on on this because it has been found repeatedly that your uh, all this ergonomic behavior you must have done in management that you perform far better, uh, you know there can be some maybe subjective curves and all provided your working is better. In long in the Russian submarines where there is only small cramped place that we have Indian Navy, your, your performance much lower than the modern nuclear cells where you have a much, you know, nicer place. You can go for a longer time, you perform better in emergency, that has all been kind of proven. So, the design obviously as we are progressing, we should try to keep, you know, we should try to design as better as possible working environment. Yeah, yeah, that is okay. That is obvious because you see if you look at this acceleration, acceleration is much more connected to you see uh, the, not, not only that, see if you know it is very interesting as you say, if you take a, if you are standing here, if it you know if you pitches, the pitch has much more this thing because why happen the, 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 the z value is z is he plus x into pitch. So, you see x is a large number in order of length. Therefore, this has a large influence. So, normally the pitching uh, contributes to large of, uh, you know, the, uh, this thing and if you do obviously dot dot this omega square will come, then this contribution is larger. But if you are absolutely at midship, maybe it is not so. If you are in the somewhat in the, nowadays accommodation, see, nowadays your accommodation is at the end. If your accommodation is at center, maybe it is not that bad for pitching. But uh, see, most modern ships you probably have gone, you have been at the aft end, most likely. Midship accommodation is almost obsolete. Therefore, your X is large. Therefore, obviously, it is pitch that causes more. This, that is obvious, you know. 
and pitch also is more uh, dominant. See, even though it is pitching 2 degrees, if the ship is say 200 meter long, it is 100 into 2 degree. So, you can you can imagine that 100 into 2 degree means, uh, you know, in radian if you make uh, 2 into what, uh, by 57, say 57 type. So, it is almost 4 meter of, you know, like if it is going down 2 degree at a distance 100 meter, it is basically going down 4 meter. What a lot and in fact heaving will not be 4 meter, heaving will be 1 meter. So, pitch contribution is normally more, that is a fact. Okay. Now, at the very beginning having done all this, there is something called polar plots and operability criteria. I just, that is the last thing we will do, operability polar plots. See what happens for almost all shifts, you have got number of index. See, I have got slamming, deck wetness, motion sickness index, maximum say roll, maybe maximum pitch, like that. Many ship owners would actually tell you, will, will give you a criteria. They will give you a criteria saying that, look, my ship cannot operate if slamming is more than so and so number, deck wetness is more than so and so number, MSI is more than so and so number, etc., etc. Okay. They can give you a number of criteria, all are actually derived responses or direct response you may call and they will give you a set of criteria. For example, uh, people will say that maximum pitch should be less than 3 degree, maximum roll should be less than uh, 10 degree for the vessel to operate for suppose it is doing some operation, uh, motion sickness rate should be less than so and so, deck wetness should be less than 1 per uh, so many hours, etcetera, etcetera. Now, you have done all this calculation, okay, there is a set of criteria given. What we can do in polar plot is something like that. You see, you draw a diagram here, where there is heading angles are here. These are all heading angles, you know, these various angles. This is say, say theta equal to 0 degree, like that 90 degree, 180 degree. You have got speed lines here. This is V equal to say 2 naught, V equal to 4 naught, V equal to say 6 naught, etc. Okay. So, you make a diagram like that. Now, you find out, let me say slamming, my slamming should be less than so and so. That is my criteria. Now, I find out that at this particular speed that exactly slamming becomes so and so provided it is at this speed, at this uh, uh, you know at this heading angle, at this speed my slamming is just like that. At this speed, at this heading angle my slamming is just like that. Like that you have the boundary in this graph. Then what happen? I will tell just very briefly tell you. You can actually join them and you find out that look if the ship is operating in this zone, this combination of heading and speed, then my slamming is going to be more than what is stipulated. In other words, see I have found a slamming, this will be for a particular sea state number equal to 4, say some given sea state. Slamming as a function of angle, heading angle and speed, obviously it depends on those two criteria for a given sea state. Now, I have, I have, I have to determine, see now I do a long uh, um, elaborate calculation. I do a calculation of all these derived response for all possible speeds of the ship and all angles, all C states. Now, for a given C state, I will find out which combination of theta and V my slamming exceeds the limit. So, I will say that if the ship is within this range, my ship is not going to not meet the slamming criteria. So, this is my operation zone. In other words, I can operate in C state 4 from the slamming point of view, provided my V and mu are within this range. This is, an, this is a simple polar plot what is called because you would like to know, this is, I will give you another example um, be probably better in terms of roll. See, this roll is maybe better. Say, see this C state, another C state, this is again 90 degree. So, normally you will find out that 90 degree roll is very high. So, you will find out that the ship at very high speed and 90 degree it may be something like that. What does it mean? See, this is, let us say this is 2 knots, this is 4 knots, say this is 0, this is 2 knots, this is 4 knots, this is say 8 knots, like that. What it means is that at 90 degree heading angle, 
any speed more than 2 knots, the ship is going to roll more than 10 degree. I mean, it is not going to uh, meet the criteria, okay. But at 90 degree, if your speed is lower than 2 uh, uh, knot, it will be quite okay. Now, obviously, what happened at th this is th this angle is let us say is uh, you know 45 degree, this, this line. Now, it will tell that, but at 45 degree angle of heading, I can go up to 4 knots. And at 90 degree, uh, uh, sorry, and at this will probably spread out. In fact, the non normally it will go like that. Now, the angle, see you are plotting there. See, you are actually finding the boundary points and then joining them together. You are actually, what you are doing is, see, you have, again, if I do that, you have a diagram here. You have actually calculated for every V and every mu. Then you find out which V and mu combination, it is just having the threshold value. So, this boundary of this curve you find out. By some rough, it can be rough interpolation. You see, so for example, you found out, let, let me give an example. See, you have done a calculation for 45 degree and for say 90 degree. You find out that at 45 um, uh, degree, uh, you know, like my slamming is so and so, 90 degree slamming is less. So, you kind of interpolate, see, my, let us say my slamming should not be, not occurred more than say 30 percent. Now, you find out that at 0 degree heading angle, my slamming does not occur, but at 30 degree heading angle, say at some heading angle here, my slamming occurs 50 percent, uh, uh, 10 percent time. At this, it occurs say 40 percent time. So, you can uh, interpolate and find out 30 percent time will occur at what, what heading angle. It is some kind of an approximation as far as interpolation is concerned. See, uh, please understand this way. Uh, uh, other way around, I will show you another, another graph. See, you have a, got a slamming here, okay. Some slamming with respect to say V. So, this graph goes like that. As the speed goes up, slamming goes up, so it goes like that. Now, your slamming criteria is this. So, you will tell that my, if my speed is, this is for a mu equal to some degree, say some, say 45 degree. So, you will say at 45 degree, if my speed exceeds this much, then my slamming is going to be more than the acceptable limit. Similarly, now you do that for another angle. Like that for each angle, you find out what is my threshold velocity or the other way around. Therefore, in this diagram for each angle, see this is my angle, I will find out up to what velocity I can go without slamming. Here I will find out, say here I found out this. Next angle I find out up to, I will say that this is this line. Here I find out it is this line. So, I join this, then I know that I cannot go on that uh, uh, another diagram is necessary. See, uh, you let us see from this diagram only. So, what I did is that simpler case we can take. Various velocities diagrams are there, let us say this is like that. Now, I found out that at this angle, at this particular heading, I can go up to all the speeds, no slamming. At this angle, I can go up to this much speed, beyond that it is going to slam. At this angle, I will find out that I have to go up to only this speed, beyond that it slams. At this angle, I, I can go only up to this speed. So, okay. That means, I must be below this zone. So, similarly, I finish this side. So, what it happen is that, if I am in this, this zone of operation, if this zone of operation, then it is going to slam more than what I prescribe. So, am I slamming must be lower than that. That now, I, I know that this is my area where I can operate without the slamming. But this was slamming. Now, you do for that for all. So, you actually you can do in a same diagram all these areas. So now, this was slamming. Now, you find out that pitching, pitching curly for, for pitching because pitching normally will be more here, you cannot operate if it is within this range. Let us say. For another response, you may find out you cannot operate within this range. Now, you overlap all of them, then you will whatever is remaining area, you, you can tell that the remaining part I can operate which satisfies all the criteria. This is what is called operability criteria. See, if you have given a set of criteria A, B, C, D, then you find out A is possible, this is combination, B is possible, this is combination, C is possible. Then you add them up, which you can tell that in C state 3, I can operate up to, you know, in this speed and this heading angle. Why this is important? Because if you have that and if you had a bad motion experience, you can actually from there estimate and try to change your speed and heading angle. 
this is why you have an upper LT. See, if you have a roll upper LT index, you know that you are suddenly meeting very high waves and very this thing. So, you can uh, approximately estimate which, uh, you know, what kind of angle and speed I should reduce in order to eliminate that. You do by experience, but this can helps you as a guide. From the design point of view, you can actually find out by the percentage area, see the remaining area, uh, if you have done all that, you know, area, area, etcetera, whatever is remaining, this as a percentage of the full area will tell you what is the percentage of the percentage of the oper operability area that you can operate in a given C state. Obviously, the, what will happen, this is going to actually become less and less as the C state goes up, because you have to do that for all C states. See, if, see for example, C state 3, you find out this is my non-operation area. In a higher C state, you may find that this you cannot operate, you know. Obviously, as the C becomes rougher, you, you, your oper operability goes up. You can then, there is no end to it, you can further combine. Now, you know that in C state 3, I can operate in this combination, 4, I can operate this, 5. Now, C is at 3 means H is equal to 5, 3 meter, 4 means H is equal to 5. Now, you combine, you, you find out that in, in, in a long term, uh, 3 meter height occurs only 10 percent time. So, this into 0 0.1, 4 meters occurs 20 percent time, this into 0 0.1. So, you can again combine that two with a long term weather statistics. So, there is a lot of statistics you can generate, you can make a lot of graphs, but essentially statistics means just finding out percentage of occurrence of certain ship motions. Uh, within certain time, you know, like a percentage of operation of certain motions or derived responses in a given C state and combining them in some fashion. This is more of an algebraic uh, operation. If you keep your mind uh, straight within with common sense, you can work it out. What you cannot work out is finding out the response itself. That requires mathematics and some hydrodynamics. But if you have the response found out by some means, you know that, you know, 10 degree or 5 degree to tell that, you know, like uh, uh, the limits, that is a more of a common sense. You know, you know 10 degree occurs at, uh, at 90 degree heading angle at 20 knot speed, but if you make it 15 knot speed, the angle will come down to 6 degree. So, you can make it out from there. It is very common sense. See, somebody says that, look, I cannot uh, allow the ship to roll more than 8 degrees, then, then you find out that 8 degree would occur uh, when the sp uh, ship speed is 16 knots. But if you go more than that, it becomes more than it. So, you know, by, uh, you know, like um, uh, by your experience. So, basically this polar plot that we do is a plot that you have uh, just to synthesize. You may say what you have done, if I, if I uh, tell uh, another thing. So, you have got various weather, that is C states. You have got number of weather. Okay, a number of weather condition. You have got number of combination of speed and heading angle, speed and heading. For all these, you have got ship, ship motions. For all these, you have got derived responses. And for all these, you have got the statistical information. That, that is, you know, how much percentage of time. So, you all you are doing is combining all the two. So, it is a lot of repetitive calculation, rep repetition for each C state, for uh, all combination, you find all the ship motion, then all the derived response and all what you required by statistical analysis that you know, you repeat that. You have got a large chunk of information, then you just put them together in various forms, that is all we are doing here. So, you know, uh, this part is a post processing part, it is actually playing with large, large numbers, a lot of people have window based programs nowadays you know, where you can do that. But as I said, to find out ship motion, uh, the most complicated part actually still arises here in find motion in regular waves, that is, or RAO. This is the most demanding task from evaluation point of view, but from practical point of view, you would like to see these results. But if you have that, my point is finally is that if you have that to get this part may appear to a beginner complicated, but really it is not complicated. It is a tedious long calculation, but not very complicated if you keep your mind uh, you know focused. That is all. Sea keeping is viewed to be complicated subject, but what the part of sea keeping you view as complicated is actually the simpler part. Okay? I mean with that I will end my lecture today and we will 
uh, uh, formally close the shift motion in waves part of the lectures. Polar plot. Okay, uh, see today we are going to talk about a topic of ship controllability BDT, or you may say this maneuverability well. This is the American spelling, this is the British spelling, okay. E U R and O E U V R A. I am just writing because we may change one to other so that we have no confusion. Basically, uh, this thing are more or less same topic. We are going to be discussing this part of the, uh, uh, you know, ship behavior which is related to, you may say, maneuvering, controllability, course keeping, etc. Everything related to a ship trying to move in the horizontal motion in the horizontal plane. Earlier I spoke about more of motion in the vertical plane that is under wave action, but here what we are going to talk about uh, is that sea is calm, there is no waves etc. Ship is moving and it is trying to turn, it is trying to, it is when it moves along a straight line you study the subject of resistance, but here we are trying to find out how it turns, should it turn, what forces is necessary to make it turn easily or what should be the characteristics so that it does not turn for a simple uh, you know like um, uh, simple forces, external forces or if it has turned because of a wave or some disturbance should it come back to its original line. All these things uh, are a part of what we call maneuverability, controllability. And this sometimes they are um, uh, kind of, we have to understand at the beginning, uh, uh, contradictory. A, a ship which is highly maneuverable means very highly you can turn it very easily becomes less controllable because it is always trying to turn. It is just like your scooter or a vehicle which is always trying to turn and if you want to make a steady course you have to hold it tight. So there is two kind of aspects again, I mean if it is something is, you know it is a tanker going on a straight line, you cannot, you give a rudder it does not turn. It's, absolutely having a very strong directional stability, but then it is not controllable. This is the part we will talk uh, in general. Uh, before that, uh, 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 let me tell you about this, uh, why the forces come. See, again looking back that, at that. Now what happened as you try to turn a ship? See when you are going on a straight line, the force is symmetric. There is no, no force coming in y direction, no moment coming in this direction. The force is absolutely along x direction only, so the ship is moving exactly on a straight line. But here what happens as you try to turn, naturally there is a asymmetry developed. The ship is not symmetric anymore as if it is having a motion and the flow is coming in this direction. And then what happens, obviously the flow goes various ways and there will be a different set of pressure and therefore there will be some kind of force coming, some kind of movement acting on that. And it is that, that which will cause the ship to turn. In other words, the only mechanism that you have to cause force on a ship which is not restrained is fluid forces. Because of the flow, because the way the flow going past it, these are the forces that will cause it to turn. You see, you give a rudder. What happens? You change the rudder. But what happens? Because you change the rudder, the flow past that develops a different pressure system and that is why there is a force. Why I am saying that is because in order to study controllability and maneuverability, we have to necessarily study fluid forces because it is that forces which will cause the vessel to turn or whether the force is very large, etc., uh, will decide if the vessel would remain steady. A simple example is given by this weathercock stuff, which is what I will just briefly mention. See, suppose there is a initial trajectory of a line and there is a particular, you know, like 
small line with a what you call uh, a large tail. Let us say there is a small thin plate with a large tail here and the tail is like that, that is the one that uh, uh, produces a, a force. What happened? It is supposed to go this side but now it has turned, by some means it has actually turned by an angle side. Then what would happen? That would obviously cause, even if it was going on a straight line, the flow was going past it. But now the flow is going past, I am just considering this, this part of it major. It is going to give some kind of a force on this direction. This force is equal to, if let me say CG, this force is equal to this force plus a moment, you know, any force can be translated back to another point or rather this force will give a moment about this center point, let us say CG point, this is say CG, okay. What it does therefore, this part, this red part of the force will cause the thing to move up because there is a force we are acting on the CG, so it is going to go up and this moment will going to make it turn like that. So, the you will expect the vessel to actually, I mean uh, this body to actually gone slightly up and then begin to turn, begin to turn. As it turns, now think of that, as it turns, this angle becomes small, so at some point it has moved up and then begin to turn. As it turns, this angle has become small. As it becomes small, the force becomes less. So ultimately there will be a point when the force has become zero, so it becomes straight line. So therefore, you are then you are, uh, the behavior is guided by the fact of how much force is coming on that, which depends on obviously angle of attack, which of course will keep on changing as the angle of attack reduces. So as an introduction, we have to realize that we have to study uh, the forces coming for a general body moving in a horizontal plane. If you want to understand even uh, the elementary maneuverability, later on of course we must talk about radar, what does radar do, okay. The, uh, the most common uh, mechanism for keeping the ship in course is the radar as we know and if you want to turn, you might have an additional device like bow thruster or thrusters on the center plane, etc., etc. In other words, you have to in introduce a force from external mechanism. That will come later on but to do that we have, we should, we should understand what kind of force come on the body. Uh, let us uh, go to a very basic definition of what is called course keeping, okay. <clears throat> now there are, there are such certain things that can occur for a course keeping. First of all, <clears throat> let me introduce the word directional stability. Thank you. 